Well, uh, good morning. It's uh, November 16th, year 2022. Here with the Hello, Hello Show, and my name is Chaim Mizrahi, continuing with the tradition of public access. And then, of course, the tradition of uh, the Hello, Hello Show that's been on the air since 1984, at least. Of course, not to fail to mention the contribution by Frederick Dougherty, Francis Anne, and of course, the likes of you that form huge groups of people who make it their business to fortify and enhance the concept of public access here at the east end of Long Island. So, uh, of course, you know, as as I, as I usually can uh, um, excusably preach you out there to the uh, extent of uh, the benefits of uh, of being associated with public access involved in what it has to offer, involved in the whole structure of it uh, on all accounts, uh, all the way from uh, spiritual to religious and scientific. And this country of ours is really thriving on the behalf of the... Uh, availability of that wonderful uh, concept, uh, the wonder behind a, uh, a, um, a calling and a formation of, uh, of opportunities that uh, also teach us about ourselves and teach us about our relationship to our community and teach us about, you know, past, present and, uh, and future and, uh, and teach, teaches us about aspirations and and about realizations and whatnot. I, uh, did I put it here? I think I lost my glasses. But anyway, I, uh, isn't it interesting to uh, realize? I hope I'm not sitting on them. Let's see. The thing is that I need glasses in order to find my glasses. So, uh, you know, I I started the trend, uh, a spree of writing five sessions, so sessions, you know, a part of a of a of a general title. Speaking of all magic, I want to share with you some of my reservations. I'm waiting for a few people to come and say hi and sit and chat with me a little bit. Chris Lecor and uh, Steve Rom that happens to be 80 years old today, yesterday or today, something like that. Let me share with you as I'm waiting for for my friends to come show up and, uh, and interact a bit. And it, as I said, it is uh, uh, Wednesday, November 16th, year 2022, here with the Hello Hello Show. My name is Chaim Mizrahi. Of all magic, uh, tremble the reaching out, the sinking of greatness, and all that follows as as should the spark enlightened and bright bring home the salvation of man, ungrateful by might, and slip the caution brought to its knees under the sealed level of granting grace and ensuring light fits. Your glance is as the rest of the world's attention combines, the sorting through of all magic wrapped round wonder, packed tightly and engulfing curve by curve to capture a lure, a gesture of an anonymous love, the kind that spreads like a butterfly's short, silky life overlooking the accompanying drama to think of the, of the drama of a butterfly the drama in the life of a butterfly the rough seas of love the rough seas of love the hate the quiet blip before the destruction of newly built dream as we get drawn to the link of pleasure and pasture, briefing, pasture briefing, grown-ups, lust spreads its signature of approval. Go ahead, pat me, if you wish. Drive sweet portion as it's all dreamlike. 
speaking of dream like you smiled for the for the last time some time no longer grieving of scratches of the heart like dreaming efforts blinking into the night it's not yours to keep though you go ahead and discharge not knowing the order of surrender it's a free roaming blast since a growing soul accept a hint from within dare to smile and become the sun dare to smile and become the sun I, I love the, the prediction you will always love me as I will always adore you as you will always love my expression as I will always treasure your friendship you faded without a warning I, and I looked for you frantically and when I found you you already belonged to the devil I pleaded from within in quiet pain and stretching humming pulling these glazes of love to show you to show you the traces of love and as my friend here I speak of love <laughs> he's here show yourself there. please have a seat I'm going to close the door not there. thank you so much very generous of you for this very considerate of you is my hair the mic is waiting for you <laughs> oh, you're looking great so here we aim to show people <laughs> at their worst <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no, I mean, that's what we're going for. Yeah, you know, we just like uh, let that kind of natural look uh, uh, surprise us even. But you know, maybe you can raise the mic a little bit up, kind of, so you don't have to. You're looking good and all this. So, yeah, Chris Lecour is here with us, and as I mentioned before, uh, we're having a group art show, and that group art show has a heritage of at least 27 years here. Uh, uh, Chris Lecour, uh, Julia Shirokova. Dan Weldon and myself, so it's going to be, um, it is actually as we speak on display and all this. So how are you doing? How's how's everything? How's the, how's the gallery, the latest show? You know, Carl Scorza was here to chat and interact. Uh, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, Carl's show was really successful. We had a fantastic turnout. Uh, and yeah, we got some really good press. We had a big article in the East Hampton Star and the East Hampton Press. So a major thanks to them. And thanks to you for hosting Carl and myself to talk about the show as well. So it was all quite successful. And then uh, now I'm planning the big holiday show at the gallery. So that is going to be like a group show with 50 artists. So it's a lot of networking with many yeah. different artists. Oh, yeah. It already is. You know, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's. Uh, um, so how much more busy can you be? Can you tell me, share with me? <laughs> <laughs> Do you leave any room to become more busy? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I feel like <laughs> yeah, don't feel don't feel like you have to answer this question. <laughs> it's busy times with the holidays. With the holiday. it's, good. it's all positively yeah. busy stuff. I mean, you're so. so busy all the time. Might as well say we have an excuse this time, <laughs> holiday, you know, two mm -hmm. back to back. And, of course, there's always breakthroughs happening in my own work as well. Yes, I'd love to hear about that, as, as my facts. I've been, I've been doing circles for a while now. Lots and I was thinking circles. about it. Are you finding the avenue to, to reach the next, you know, the first square coming out of these circles? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I've just started playing with rings. Rings. And so that's that's been interesting, like other rings coming around the circles like it stays in the planetary theme it's like okay know, ringed planets but it also adds some dimension and some swoop around the work and it's also a challenge because i'm trying to use the same uh paint sheet process that i use for the circles but they they're not as willing to be cut out in those unnatural shapes. Yes. So, so you mean it's shape within a shape within a shape within a shape. Is yeah, like that a uh, shape on top? Yeah. 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 So so that 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 becomes suddenly I mean quickly enough uh, three dimensional. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, do you think of color separately while you're actually busy creating the the texture and the shape? 
Is that, uh, or is it like goes hand in hand, the plan to put the two together, so to speak? I think it goes hand in hand in a way, but also uh, I'm sort of, like with the sheets, I feel like I choose a palette and then I make a bunch of sheets with that palette. And then with there, it's sort of figuring out what I want to do. Like the palette's already been decided, so now how do I want to section and use these pieces? And related to the palette, correct? I would yeah. assume, yeah. And I can always just take a piece of, well, that's that's kind of why I like to save some sheets up too, because I change palettes over the weeks, and then like if I don't use it all, I can sort of keep it in the collection, and then it can be a more complicated uh, composition, bringing together together several different palettes. So, I mean, did you did you ever think of showing separately, maybe sometime in the future, just like the dub which you actually build on the surface of the canvas, but independently? I've like, yeah, like independent of the canvas? I've considered... Because it has its own qualities, you know, it's very unique in itself. Yeah. I've definitely considered some things, like... Uh, I think it's always good. It's it helps people to see like just the sheet of paint. They actually like they can understand how I'm building uh, these compositions a lot better. So I think it's it's useful as a tool to help people understand my work. But just displaying the sheets on their own, I feel like they're too fragile. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, and like they're they're temperature dependent as well. So they're really you know, once they're situated on a canvas they're pretty tough now they're they have acrylic backing and canvas backing but while they're on their own you have to be quite careful with them especially yeah. while now it's getting cold out instead so of like workable plastic becomes it's more rich, like a yeah. tortilla yeah. chip yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you have should have a show called a tortilla chip <laughs> Just, um do you uh um um what was i what did I want to ask? I wanted to ask uh, something, a brilliant question, but it, <laughs> it's not there anymore. <laughs> the, um, um, the working in front of the crowd out there, I mean, in the heart of your gallery, obviously it's uh, something unusual, but not uh, unheard of. I mean, uh, did you have to go over, get over some hurdles on the account of exposing yourself? Like, or did it just feel natural since day one to just work and let people see exactly what you're doing? Which artists usually don't like to do that, really. I think there's... I try to feel natural doing it. It's nice when, like, one group of people comes in and we can kind of start having a dialogue and then I can basically explain what I'm doing with my process. I feel like when people come in, I almost... Like, because there's painting shown in sort of the area that I'm working as well so sometimes I feel like I want to like stop and get out of their way and talk about all the paintings in the show with them like more acting as a curator rather than just someone working in my space while they're in there so it kind of depends on what the person wants to do what they want to talk about and what they're interested in if they want to talk about my work I'm happy to go on show them some, I've made pours with people and like let sort of let them get involved so it just depends yeah. on them. so <laughs> so you know according to the deposit of experience that you've gathered in the last couple of years that you're kind of uh, uh, you know operating a gallery so what, what did you learn about the demeanor of the demeanor of the prototype artists out there in the east end of long island i mean what what kind of a view did you form an opinion that you form about what the, that in particular individu individual is all about? I think it's very hard to put artists in a box. <laughs> so it's that's kind of a tough question to answer in general because they're all so different. And it's, uh, so I think, I mean, I kind of, uh, I kind of mentioned last time I was here, like what I really look for is people who are passionate about their work and the ideas that they're pursuing. So I don't think there's like one way to describe the archetype of a person who is artist. I think it's just like everybody is so following. I was, I was more relating to a feel, you know, a certain feel that is common to, to artists. I mean, if you were to ask me, I can answer you without really relating 
to a, 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 a fixed uh, idea or declaration or statement that will fit all of them. M more like the energy, more like the attitude, you know. Mm -hmm. I meant like that. And obviously you would have to go through that and get to know a lot about it because, you you know, you collect the work, you get in touch with them, you talk to them, you converse, you make phone calls, you hang, you try and solicit, you, you, you know, you take work down, you associate still continually with artists and all this. So you get to see all the aspects of, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's 99% that and 1% actually studio work, which usually we never get to see. Uh, you know, what the artists are really, really doing. I mean, unless they volunteer their desire to share with you. <clears throat> but in that sense, I'm sure you have a, a quite a hefty data about yeah. the demeanor, meaning, you know, just a pattern of behavior, just a, what strikes you in terms of uh, um, something that maybe more than one artist share with the, with the other artists. I think there's definitely like a spirit of perseverance. Yeah, that's good. Like always, artists are sort of always pushing their work forward no matter what's happening in their life. Like it could be good, it could be bad, no matter what they're transcribing that experience and like pushing it forward in their art and in so persevering through their lives while they're at it. <laughs> that's a great description. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I think it's, is that uh, Steve Rom? Hey, I told, <laughs> you know Steve Rom, don't you? I don't know if I met, yeah, I know your work though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's why don't you join us? Just, just join us, it's okay, sit here, you, you sit here, okay? Can I be there? I'd be happy to leave. <laughs> um, He's 80 years old, you know, he's a... Um, I need, he's, a, I need he a rocking suffers, chair. He suffers from more chair. than one condition. <laughs> no, many more than one condition, and you're one of them. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, go ahead, push your luck. No, uh, I mentioned that you're going to be here, and I'm going to adjust the camera here and make it look uh, as if... As if uh, here we go. And your name again? Chris Lucle. I have a gallery out in Toronto. Oh. I've heard of it. Looking for a really good artist? Always. <laughs> Next question is, do you sell the art that you get? Um, a lot of the times. Okay. <laughs> okay, try and speak to the, to, the, um, to the mic, and he's loud already, as I saw it. I mean, strong. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's good, actually. Oh, something like this, yes. Yeah, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, Steve Rom. Happy birthday, Steve. Thank Is you. it yesterday or today? Yesterday. Yesterday and all this. So, uh, um, you're going downhill, baby. Uh, tra <laughs> trauma, trauma built in a It's okay. We only way. know each other 30 years. I mean, knowing Heim for 30 years and turning, turning 80, it's like the first thought I had was get up in the morning, take out the gun, blow your brains out, and then you don't have to do a show anymore. <laughs> Uh, and you will be at peace. I, uh, time doesn't let you get any peace at all. I interviewed him when he was actually good looking. That's how long ago. And he had hair. And uh, I had hair, correct. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of vanishing. You have none and you love it. Please don't show. But uh, Beard's um, gone. I, I, I'm glad that Chris is here with us uh, on a serious note. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, the, the Steve Ram is... Uh, is a is a, a wealth of knowledge and information and experience that stretches deep and and wide and uh, like I said on a serious note being my mentor for years I don't take it lightly uh, many of my crossroads uh, did not suffer from uh, uh, too much dwelling and and I s always managed to kind of lubricate myself out quickly it was always just the right amount of advice yes not to over and I have to admit uh, you you didn't say much but you helped a lot and <clears throat> that otherwise I would I just uh, to imagine now what I know now how much I would have had to toil and 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 struggle in order to get to where I did eventually get if it wasn't for you and you know it's it's the 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 contribution is meaningful so I can give you that much, and still now and then I remember vaguely <laughs> how much you did for me. 
<laughs> it doesn't go away. And also the last show that we did, did you submit the two pieces? It's a miracle in itself. I didn't get to the walk town, away from the two paintings the entire show. The town does not stop talking about this. I mean, the they, they come to me and they say, where did he come up with this freaking $100,000 price tag? I said, you know, you're lucky that it's only 100000 That's right. But they mentioned that. They mentioned that in all this. Good for you. A great achievement. Well, that's what I used to sell my paintings for in the days when paintings were selling. Yeah. And when I was with um, the gallery in New York, um, across from Kennedy, I've, at 80 I'm allowed to forget names. Yeah. But uh, it was a major gallery. And paintings, my paintings were selling for 50000 60000 And out here at uh, the gallery we had out here, uh, all my paintings sold for 10000 the small ones. Yes. So I was in that price range, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to do the show, and you convinced me to do the show, I might as well put the real prices on it. And if it doesn't sell, it doesn't sell, but at least people get to see what I do. Yeah, and, done. And uh, it worked out really well in that... A lot of people saw it, and I was busy to the entire time explaining things to people. It was fun. It was yeah. really enjoyable. No, I noticed that you did, and you know, increases the new generation of that uh, breed, uh, breed of gallery uh, owners, uh, you know, operators. Uh, I, I think Chris is a little more than just an operator, a very promising entity, talented, you know. And uh, I, I got to meet with him a couple of years ago, and uh, now we're getting to know each other more and more, and, and making things happen. Uh, hopefully you'll be a part of the next show that I have here uh, the first week of December, so we'll talk about that. But uh, we were talking, Chris and I, before you came, about uh, him in the two years that he has his gallery open in Montauk that becomes more and more known and more and more appealing, uh, what kind of a sense he gathered about the supposedly human prototype that represents artists here at the East End of Long Island. So, so he... Uh, uh, Spoke well, you're in for a treat because most of the artists out here, except for us, uh, are nuts. And um, they'll argue with you over everything, placement of whether you put their painting or the color of the wall or the date of the show or whatever it is. Um, what they have to understand, what people don't understand, is that you run the gallery. And when you bring your painting in, it's like leaves on tops. I would drop the painting off and leave it up to them. They knew what they were doing. And you know, Lise on tops used to be on uh, Newtown Lane, a great gallery. It was a New York Soho gallery. And there wasn't, uh, they would do a new show every month. And there wasn't a single Friday that I didn't get a phone call from Arnie. Do you have any more paintings at home? Why? Because we sold everything that's here, and we have nothing to put in the window. Twice. So I would say, yeah, I've got more paintings, so I would bring paintings over. And he'd put the new paintings in, and he'd sell those also. And they just, I don't know how many years they were in business, but they just ran out of energy. And the, and the gallery business started to change. And uh, people were coming for, the artists were bringing their friends and they were drinking their wine and eating their cheese, and nobody was buying anything. So it was the same in my industry. Um, no matter who I published, it didn't make any difference. Um, we started dealing with the Chinese knocking stuff off, which was a big problem. And uh, no matter he was in the business of posters. I so. published fine art posters, and uh, no matter how how good you were. It didn't make any difference because the Chinese are capable of knocking anything off. And what we would sell for $50, they'd sell for $5. And you can't sue them. So And you can't compete with them. And you can't compete with them. But, but you know what, actually speaking, the, the, uh, I just remembered vis-a-vis uh, -vis our discussion. So what, I mean... Uh, when you work in the heart of your space that you actually present to represent other artists, the, the, what, what, what kind of progress are you witnessing in terms of your work, having that space as your studio? That's what I wanted to know. Well, I mean, I love it. I feel like I'm, I've been moving forward for the entire amount of time that the gallery has been open. Like, I, I can kind of 
look back through the archive of works I've done since I've been here, and it's like a steady, a steady stream of, of new stuff and changes. So I mean, I, I feel like, and it's productive time for the gallery because it's all time that the gallery's open. I'm in there, yeah, getting my own use out of it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's fabulous. <laughs> so when you think of ten years from now, for example, what how's how's your gallery going to look like? Well, at least what are you hoping for it to be like? Uh, it's okay. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, Steve, you can answer this question. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll compare it to a, a gallery that I discovered almost around the corner from my house. Uh, a gallery opened. Uh, Tripoli. Tripoli. And I went in. Um, I have to say. It's a weird it, one, no? It, it's beyond weird. The guy that owns it has a certain amount of arrogance that is not going to win him many friends. And he was showing his girlfriend's work, which left a lot to be desired. And I went in and just asked a simple question. I said, are you looking for artists? Which I would say to you, or I would say to any gallery owner. And I said to him, I said, I know that this is not the right way to do it. I apologize. I just happen to be in the area. I live around the corner, so simple question. All I need is a simple answer, yes or no. You know, and he was not courteous. And I said, you know, he's nailing walls together and painting things, and he said, I have an opening this weekend. I said, where's the advertising? I haven't gotten to it. I said, well, you know, out here you've got to let people know because your building's hidden. It's pretty much out of sight. And it's not like people are going to pull off the highway because they see a little sign tacked to a tree that says Tripoli Gallery. And I said, and if that's your attitude towards your customers, they're going to walk in and walk out. I said, you, you don't know who I am. You have no idea who I am. So it was one of those yeah. not exactly great meetings that if somebody walked in, I mean, I have had 600 artists under contract. And if somebody walked in, if Haim walked in, I'd throw him out right away. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if he walked in with a portfolio, I would have the courtesy to look at his work and politely say it either fit into what we were publishing or it didn't fit into what we were publishing. And I would take that time, five minutes, ten minutes, because you never know who walks through the door. And you never know what they have to offer. And it's not going to ruin your day. And this guy just... Yeah, but also maybe you caught him in the right, the wrong moment and, you know, and all this. I, uh, by now I take them with a grain of salt, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I wasn't upset about it. I just figured, yeah. you know, hopefully he learns that when somebody walks in the door, they could be a multimillionaire and they love what's hanging on the wall and they're ready to buy five paintings. You know, and you can't, you have to be as friendly to them as you are to one person who walks in who may not have a dime. And you don't know until you get down to the actual. Yeah, you, who you're dealing with, you're exactly. Dealing with. And it's all a this. business of making friends. It's, it's a <laughs> business of making a, a friends, acquaintances, and you never know who the person is that walks in that door. And you have to be polite to everybody that comes in. And. Um, so, uh, so like being, well, man, you're 80 years old. I mean, God bless. Uh, you're actually looking good for 80, uh, really, on a, on a serious note. But uh, as far as painting, you know, staying away, you know, uh, the, uh, Steve uh, in the last 10, 15 years wasn't really like uh, creating per se as he could have, should have, as, he, as much as he wanted to and all this. But I wonder about the... Uh, um, what, what, for example, happens to you if you don't paint for, like, a, a month? I mean, do you really feel it? You, <coughs> is, it, it is it a part of, of you in such a way that actually it makes you feel funny or in a certain way if you're not painting? I haven't gone a month without painting. Okay, so that's, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, 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 that's the answer. <laughs> That's the answer. Well, I, it's interesting. Steve, did you hear what he said? I heard what he said, yeah, but I've, he I've also read some bios on some really famous artists that came from the Hamptons who used to get together in the city 
at a bar and they would start the, the, yeah they didn't paint for the for years and then but still but know. a lot of them went for a long period of time without painting and then suddenly they were inspired with something and they would go into a painting mode and you couldn't talk to them or speak to them or anything for two or three years while they were creating so i think the same thing happens with me in that i have to have some it's not inspiration it's something that happens in your brain that i see the painting and i've done this since i was a kid since i had my first show at the age of seven i have to see the thing in my head and as soon as i see it in my head it's done then i go into the studio and i fill it basically fill in the canvas because i know what it looks like and yeah. i don't have to struggle with it because i and i make changes as i go along but that clarity of thought is critical for me. And there's simply times that, you know, I could go into the studio tomorrow or today and I have no idea what to paint and I end up with a mishmash. So uh, so the $100,000 price tag on that painting includes the 20 pounds of marijuana that you smoked while you were painting it? <laughs> I don't think it was 20. I mean... I told you, I used to get up in the morning and go into the studio and look at it and go, I can put more dots in there. Yes, I know. You know and at that time, I hadn't had cataract surgery. So I used, to, just to give you an idea as to how bad my vision was, when I went to the printers and the first print would come off the, the six-color Heidelberg and they'd put it on the counter and the guys had the loops and the lights and everything, I would just look at it and go, the yellow is out of line. The red's got to come up. And the guys would look at me and say, how do you know that? I said, because I'm basically blind and I could see the dots. Yeah, so move, I love that. That's move, great. Move the yellow <clears throat> in and, one line and move the red up one line and you'll be in registration. And then I would take it. They're looking under fluorescent, daylight fluorescent lights. And I said, that's not going to do me any good. I got to take it outside. And suddenly the color of the print changes drastically in daylight. Yes. And, and I go back in and I say, but, but yellow comes down. That's a proposed squinting, you know, because you remind me now of, of squinting, which, uh, which happened to me between the transition between thinking that I don't need glasses and get, finding out that I have to have glasses. Okay. Yeah, now it's so now, yeah, and then, then, then I, then I kind of changed my view about squinting because I always use squinting purposely and intentionally in order to change my style or right. to improve my style. But you were so stoned at some points that you mistaken your brush for a joint. No. You know? No. It was just, it was just a, this painting is huge. And it's, it's got, I don't know how many, millions of dots in it. And I would get up in the morning and I'd go into the studio and I would just say to myself, I can put more dots into those flowers. And I'm using a triple zero brush. Three hairs on the brush. So I wet the brush, dip it in paint, put a dot in, dot, 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 you get through the whole thing. And I go, well, that area could use some dots. And I put more dots in. So I while you add it, you cover your your, uh, your you know, grounds when it comes to the, the necessary dots that are still not on the surface. It was, I mean, I could take that painting and hang it on the wall today and add another thousand dots to it. Easy. Easily. Oh, yeah. Easily. And you wouldn't even know the difference except that it had more dots in it, and there's no end in sight. I mean, you, I could get to the point where it almost looked like a Surratt. Yeah. You know. And also, I do the relationship between dots. When I do my dotted surface, with kissing your feet, kissing your face, you know, kind of thing. You know, because you always kiss the feet of someone that kisses somebody else's face, you know. And it just goes on and on and on. And then you go according to the missing link, you know. Uh... I would assume there's at least 500,000 dots in a, in a surface of 4 by 8. Easy. Easily. And, and, uh, and you don't think about it. And, and so you wonder if, because in order to prevent yourself from feeling like you bury yourself alive in the quest for fulfillment, uh, you think, you invent a game, you know. Oh, this one is kissing her face, I'll kiss his feet. This one is kissing his, her feet, I'll kiss her face. Things like that. I mean, you don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm thinking like layers over layers over layers. So it can come from here, from here, from here, from here, from here, you know. Even though it's, it's one-dimensional, but in your head, you view it as three-dimensional and you act accordingly. And then the, 
evidently at the end of the game, it becomes extremely three-dimensional. It's that big painting is three-dimensional. It's not a... Uh, I was asked to do like a Grandma Moses type painting, which is one-dimensional. And I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So consequently, there's a waterfall that comes down, and there are fish leaping up, and then there's a lake that comes forward, and then there's more water that comes down. So it's got dimensions to it that don't necessarily make sense, but they do work in the painting. And that's the only criteria that you have to live by is that no matter what you do or how um, unregulated your dimensions are, they have to relate to each other in some way. I have a, you know, know the big painting that's in the garage in the studio? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, I woke up one night, had a vision of looking through a window, which looked through another window, which looked down on a street. So that was what I painted in the beginning, and the rest of the canvas is white. And I knew what the rest of the canvas was going to be. So, And I have these very thin red lines that I put through that carries your eye through the window, through the window, to another place, to, an, to another area. There's a whole wall that looks like it's just the surface part of, part of the painting, but there's a red line that goes over it and takes you to another wall. And it just keeps going, and then it brings you back, and um, it's like a, a guidepost. Mm. It's a, a thing, but you know, it looks flat at first until you really look at it, and then it has depth to it. It has dimension to it. So I'm actually asking you the question again. I mean, ten years from now, what what the Chris Lecour, Lecour Gallery would be? What? I mean, I'm, 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 I, I I ask it as a serious question. I know. I, I, <laughs> I, I'm just like you know. I'm you know me. I'm focusing on everything for next year. I can't think about ten years. But just I mean, I'm like I said. I'm here. It's a business of making friends, making friends with, or being willing at least to make friends with everybody who comes in the door, or being willing to hear them out. So I mean, even just in the process of two years, I've made enough friends with just artists to be having this holiday show with fifty artists. So. Ten years of making friends. Who knows where we'll be? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So. Where is your gallery in, East, in Montauk? It's um, um, five hundred feet east of the post office. Yeah, it's right next to Pamela's uh, hair salon across from. That's where you get your haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> so that. Yeah. No. Let me just mention that we're sitting here on uh, Wednesday afternoon. November 16th year 2022 here with the Hello Hello Show. And my name is Chaim Mizrahi. Chris Lecor is here with us. Steve Rom is here with us. He, he turned 80 yesterday and all this. So uh, uh, are you going to be like Fraser Dougherty living to be 101 and still kind of... I hope not. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's enough being 80. So what are your, your aspirations for the next 24 hours? <laughs> Survive. <laughs> Survive. <laughs> So, no, really, how did you feel? Uh, I, because I know we talked a lot about you turning um, 80. What was really nice is that Lenore's daughter and entire family threw a birthday party for me. All the grandkids were there. Uh, the whole family was there. Uh, all the sons were there. So it felt like my family. It felt uh, really good, and it just softened the impact that I was feeling about turning 80, and it was up to that point, it was very isolated. This, this, the social situation out here has changed drastically since we've had the virus, and um, it was nice to be amongst a lot of people, all friends and all, all really family, to be with a, f a family who cared um, that it was my birthday, and you know we celebrated it all together. And two other uh, of the kids also had uh, birthdays in November, so it was really nice. You know, we all exchanged presents, and uh, it it just felt right, and it felt really good, and it broke the tension that I was feeling about turning eighty. And um, as, can can as you we, elaborate about these feelings, really? I. Uh... Uh, my friend in Australia said to me, and he's 
he just turned 72. He said, what are you worried about turning 80? He says, complain to me when you turn 90. He says, then you can really bitch. So I said, thanks a lot. So, um, you know, it's, it's all relative. You know, is 80 that different from being 50? In a lot of ways it is because it's, it affects you physically, mentally. I don't know if it's that different. Um, if you want to paint, you paint. If you want to paint something really great, you could paint something really great. It doesn't limit you at all in what you can create. If anything, it gives you more knowledge because you can look back on what you've done and you can simply say, I don't want to do that anymore. I've done that. So now I'm going to do something that I haven't done, and it's got to be. I, th I think the, the thing that I learned in college, which was a great, great school, is that don't create your masterpiece with your third painting, because if you do, there's nothing left to do the rest of your life. But but who says that if you create your masterpiece, that means it's the end of the story? It's just the beginning of creating masterpieces. If you can continue to create masterpieces. Well, you should really hope so you know, that, that you, you would. so, but in a lot of cases, people build to it as they progress and as they change and as they learn. I mean, every painting is a learning experience. And you find things out that you didn't know on the last painting. And... So each one theoretically should get better than the one that was before it. And I think at a certain point, and this is a guess, that you reach something or you do something that you can't surpass. And that becomes, if it, if it works all together, that yeah, becomes well, your masterpiece. It's known that it's difficult and you work with that. But, you know, when I first started, I was like, you know, how am I going to... Uh, how am I going to save my life before, uh, before I'm before I'm going to die? Which is like I felt like I'm going to just uh, evaporate into the thin air, introducing myself to the community. At first, like I, when I first sent my first invitation for a solo exhibition, 99% of the people who came asked me which piece is mine. You know, they never thought that a I'm an artist, and definitely didn't believe that I mean they didn't even bother to look that it was actually a solo exhibition. So then people came to me and told me, oh, you got long ways to go and all this. And I used to say, really? Thank you. As if I didn't know. <laughs> of course I have long ways to go. But, um, but I, had to, I had to really uh, uh, play head games with myself more than actually trying to figure out what painting is all about. Just use my skills to pretend, you know. I did a lot of solo exhibitions just pretending that I'm a great artist. And keeping up that demeanor in the studio. Every time I used to enter that studio in Springs Fireplace Road, I picked up a sensation of importance. And I was only myself there, so I didn't have to feel shy, intimidated, you know. It's me, myself, and I. I play the games that I know that benefit my journey, make me feel stronger. And, and the very first thing that I learned about this strength is to be able to say, I don't know. Simple as that. I think you can't focus too hard on the masterpiece either. Like once you've made the masterpiece, it's good to just I don't have think it. I, but it's about focusing on the journey through making the art. And the next one doesn't even have to be better than the last one. It's just about the fact that you're continuing to make another one and it's different. And maybe it will be better than the next one. I never sit down and say, I'm going to paint my masterpiece. Yeah. Because it could be worse than the painting that I did before. <laughs> so there's never a goal that that I go into the studio and say, this is going to be my masterpiece. It's, it's a tough expectation and, and to hold. And <laughs> it, it inevitably turns out to be worse than the last painting that I did. So I just go into the studio and I start painting and things happen. You know the abstract that I did. I had That's one of the few paintings that I had a general idea as to what I was going to do. And when I finished the painting, I looked at it and I said, I don't know where this came from. This floors me because it just, I mean, every time I look at it, I see something different because it was learning from him that I did a lot of that painting because I did brush strokes and I did things that I never did before. I took big brushes, I took the paint, and I did big strokes like he'll, he, used, he did. 
and I didn't know what was going to come out of it. And instead of detailing them and putting things in, I left them. And I continued to paint like that, and then I combined some of my things and, and some of the how to divide the painting into sections. And by the time it was finished, with all the layers in it that you could see through and everything, it floored me as a painting. I don't know where it came from, but I know that a lot of his influence was in the painting. Well, I'm glad I've been of help, but I, know I don't want to hold you. I don't know if you need to leave or anything, but... Uh, I'm I, supposed to be... I'm doing... It's my day off, so yeah. naturally I'm doing gallery stuff. Yeah, yeah that's... A, I know. If office. you want to leave the labels, I can I can put them on or something or... Um, I can put them on. Okay. Uh, yeah. By the way, uh, I have two pairs of uh, shoes for you if you want to take them and choose one of them or whatever. It's in the car you, if you want to... Certainly. I don't want to interrupt. No, no, no. So I, I'll give you the key to put in my car. You know, the... Uh, the uh, mercury. The mercury, yeah. yeah. The silver mercury. In the back. In the, on the, on the yes, side. and in the back seat, there are two boxes. And you'll see. You'll pick and choose if you want both of them, one of them. But definitely the boot is the one that I wanted to give you. But I have another sneaker. There's, you know, whatever. Okay. So uh, check it out and come and let me know. I'll let you know. Okay, thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, He'll give me the address and phone number. I'll call you. I'm giving you address. nothing. Perfect. Absolutely nothing. And he doesn't get any more advice. I got, I got <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you, and I'm glad I got to talk to you. Okay, thank back. you. Yes, thank definitely. You. Take care. Okay, let me see what we can do now here. Uh, uh -huh. Usual suspect here. Okay, it's pretty good. I think you're looking pretty attractive. I so think that um, he needs to have more of a burning desire to make the gallery work. No, the gallery works very well. You know, He's doing very well. I'll, I'll go out and see the gallery. Yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. It's definitely good. Uh, but it doesn't matter which gallery will give you a show. If you have the paintings and if you're actually active and all this, that's what matters, you know. Otherwise, what? What are we going to do exactly? You know, today, I you know, had a conversation with your friends not too long ago, and I said, you know, it's like, it's funny. I, I'm actually ready for 12 solo exhibitions any given time. You know, someone wants to come and show my work, I can really give them choices, options, you know, a wealth of pay, of, you know, just, just a, wealth, a wealth of material, you know. And I learned that, you know, apropos what we were talking about earlier, I learned that early on that, you know, I'm going to create now and in, uh, in a frenzy. And I'm going to do it the way that I know how to do it, just like I paint a house in one week that takes another crew a month. Right. Um, it's a good thing. You make more money, you work faster, and you still keep up that level of quality. And you realize that you can implement it on other mediums, you know, which I did. So now uh, people were busy just kind of, Trying to figure out how I'm, how come I'm creating so much, and where is that coming from? So, I keep them in in a, in a point where they they cannot even begin to think of the art or to examine the art or even critic the art. Good for me. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I spared myself from from uh, hate mail, <laughs> you know, something uh, well, metaphorically always, speaking. There are always people that no matter what you do, I mean, they'll go up to a Rembrandt. And say that's terrible painting. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, uh, we were in the museum one time. I was with my wife and my daughter, and we were looking at a um, forget who it was, um, famous artist, and uh, the name will come to me. Names don't come to me quickly anymore. And I was pointing out to my daughter anatomy. And I said, anatomy is crit. If you're going to paint figures, you have to know your anatomy. You can't do certain things and get away with it if you don't know the anatomy that's supposed to go underneath the muscles and, and everything else. You can't bend an arm a certain way if it doesn't function that way. Did you like it? Yeah. yeah those purple laces on there? Yeah. Those are going to look great in the gallery. Yeah, so you can take both or one, whatever you want, you know. I left the sneakers for now. I just okay. Boots. Good choice. Fabulous. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, thank I'll, you. I'll see you soon. Thank you for the labels also. Okay, bye-bye. Um, so, yeah, the... Uh, so here's a famous artist hanging in the museum 
And I'm pointing out to my daughter that the artist who is famous didn't know anatomy. But the painting's really impressive. The painting is beautiful, but the anatomy is wrong, which bothers me. Now, obviously, it doesn't bother 99% of the people that look at it. Because they don't know better. Because they don't know. You know, it's like you can't do, for me, if I'm going to do it, I have to know my anatomy that goes underneath it. I don't do figure painting. It's not my thing. But, it, you know, um, the landscapes, um, I, th I think that one of the things, and you haven't seen some of them, some of my early, very early work, which was very surrealistic, was back in the 60s. A lot of it was anti-war stuff. But it was painted really beautifully. And that transitioned into my walking into a gallery and showing the work to the gallery owner, who said to me, uh, they're beautiful, they're great, but I can't sell surrealism. Oh, and what they can said, you yeah. do this? And she handed me a book. And she said, if you can paint like this, I can sell it. So I went home, and I did a painting. And I, I've told you the story before. And I brought a painting back to her two weeks later. And she called me up a week later. And she said, I have good news and bad news. And I said, what's the good news? She said, I sold the painting. I said, what's the bad news? She said, I sold it twice. Oh, yeah. So I <laughs> said, how am I supposed to, you know, having ethics at that time, which gives way as you get older and smarter, she said, move one tree from one side to the other side. There's so much in it, they'll never know the difference. And you will have sold two paintings. And so I did another painting, same exact painting, but with the tree on the other side. And they took it. They never knew the difference. And I continued painting primitives, which became more and more sophisticated as I went on. And they started changing into other things. They all sold. And um, eventually I had a show, now I remember the name, at Hammer Gallery, two-person show with Eric Sloan, who's a major artist. And um, I was selling a lot of paintings. And when I was with Lee's on top, I sold everything that went in there. And then they went out of business. They closed up because they'd had it. And I just haven't been with any real galleries um, since that time. I've sold some private, you know, private commissions and haven't really tried to do anything um, as far as galleries go uh, since that time. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of gallery he has, if he can take one or two paintings, and if he thinks he can sell it, I'll put it out there. I have nothing to lose. So uh, we'll see what happens. Are you done? I'm done. <laughs> you remind me of Joe Franklin. The Joe Franklin show is absolutely... I loved the, it. The, the Joe Franklin... 1 a.m. every day, every night, remember? I mean, you could watch Joe Franklin. It was like everybody that I loved watched him. Joe Franklin was stoned. He yeah, had to but be I'm stoned not. Because he had a desk yeah, and he had what? his chair for his guest. And Sorry. His guest I, would yeah, come I, in. Uh, just Leah, what's up? Wait, uh, but uh, but uh, you don't want to go to. Uh... Okay, so uh, I'll um, hold on one second. I'll be there in uh, like uh, three ten. Uh, it's Sag Harbor Library. Okay, I'll call you. I'll call you when I'm when I'm there, which will be like three three fifty. Who are you gonna go with? No, no, I, I'll, uh, I don't know. Okay, uh, I'm in the middle of something now. I'll I'll call you around three when I'm there. Okay. Well, go to uh, to side to uh, harbor. Uh, no, that's the, the full extent that you can do. Okay. Um, I don't know what to tell you right now, okay? I'm, I'm, I cannot focus, so just wait for me. I'll see you.
Okay, good. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, good, that's good. I'm sorry, I, I cut your chain of thought. What was it? I was saying that, uh, now if I can remember, um, I'm trying to think of where we were. Uh, the, the gallery with the painting, leaves on tops and whatnot. Um, train of thought disappears really quickly these days. Um, Oh, yeah, I was trying to do that. That's good. Sorry about that. And anyway, um, working with Arnie and Elizabeth was great because they knew what they were doing, and uh, they knew how to hang a show. Um, other people uh, just, for whatever reason, never took the work, which would have fit into this show. One of the gallery owners out here signed a contract with me, wanted the work, and then when it came time to hang it, called me up and said, I changed my mind. I said, but you have a signed contract. And he said, I'm not going to do the show. So I said, fine. I said, if that's your attitude, I'm really glad I didn't exhibit with you. So and it's somebody fairly well known out here. But um, it's, you know, it's a tough community to try and sell artwork in because um, you're dealing with gallery owners, a lot of whom don't know what they're selling or don't know how to run a gallery or don't know how to hang work. Um, there are very few that really know what they're doing and those are the ones that are exceptional. I mean, I don't know what happened with Pace this past summer. They had a sign up that said Pace Gallery, um, which is a major gallery. I looked in the door, which was locked, and there was stuff inside, but there were no lights on. I don't know if it ever opened or if they used it just to say that they were exhibiting in the Hamptons. Um, I never saw anybody there. There was never an ad for Pace Gallery. I have no idea what was going on. And um, They don't try at all to make you aware of what's going on. You know, Did they you see the way they, they, they cover the windows? It feels like, yeah. uh, feels like a dungeon. Uh, Ex exactly. feels like they do the best they can to prevent you from... Uh, Seeing anything. Yeah, yeah, and they, they took major real estate... And they're doing it only for private showings. Yeah. Mainly. I mean, it, it just made uh, no sense. They just want their name there. It's yeah. pathetic. I it's mean, pathetic. You know, there's there's so many opportunities out here to open a real gallery. And I think the closest that anybody came to a real gallery was Lee's on Tops. It was a Soho gallery. And they knew what they were doing. They knew what artists to pick. And in the days that things used to sell... All of their artists sold, and unfortunately, when they closed, um, what ended up being out in Amagansett were the artists who really didn't sell, but were friends with the gallery owner, and what happened? Inevitably, she went out of business. So that was sort of predicted um, when everybody went by and said, you know, she didn't take the people that had a success record, she took people that she was friends with. And that's not the way you pick art. Hmm. And that's not the way you try and sell art. And I think that um, your, your friend here has to, if he's going to have a gallery, he's got to be committed to really running a gallery. It, you can't do it just as it happens. You've got to be committed to doing it, to putting up announcements, to hanging shows, to getting people to come in, if unless he wants to do it as a hobby. And if it's his studio and he just puts up some work and does a show once in a while, that's different. But if you're going to have a real gallery, and Montauk is a really busy place in the summer where a lot of people who have a lot of money go out there, and if they get to see paintings that they like, they're going to buy them. But he's got to be in a position where he's really promoting what he's got. Oh, yeah, and he does. I mean, you know, he's, he's talking about a person that can really is very compatible with what it takes to run a gallery, even though he, he is young and looks young. But he's accumulating uh, experience. Uh, he's doing very well. I did very well in my show there. Uh, hopefully we can connect you with him. Hopefully uh, he can show you work. And also I want to pursue and, and show the rest of the work that you have there in your studio, in your basement, and um, 
Yeah, but but that's something that we can discuss differently. Uh, uh, to um, so um, <clears throat> let, let me see how much time we have left because we have just a few minutes left, and I think it's ten to three. Okay, so we're done. We get like one minute. So let me just conclude by saying we're going to be here uh, tomorrow as much as we were here yesterday and as much as we're here today. This afternoon, uh, November sixteenth, year two thousand and twenty-two, here with the. Hello, hello, Sean. My name is Chaim Mizrahi, continuing with the tradition of public access and the tradition of the Hello, hello show that's been on the air since 1984, uh, maybe even sooner. Uh, keep up the good spirits. Thank you to my guest, uh, Steve, uh, I mean, Chris Lecour and Steve Rum. Steve, thank you for being here. And awesome. happy birthday. Many awesome. more to come. Yeah. I love you. You know, I respect you, you know, and, and, I, and I admire our friendship and, and, and all and of the still above. still owe me a cup of coffee. Yes, yeah, we're going to have something today even as soon as, as now. Keep up the good spirits. We'll see you soon. Take care.